Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name's Jenny Ramone. Welcome to a combined formations and Nottingham Trent University Black Writing in Britain module event. Today, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you to two inspiring guest speakers, Professor Joss Gunn and Yolanda Lear. I'll introduce them briefly and then I'll hand over for their presentations and at the end we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers and some discussion. First, I'm really happy to be able to introduce Professor Gus John to you today, um, as well as being one of the co-founders of the Communities Empowerment Network. Gus is also a writer, an education campaigner, a consultant, a lecturer and a researcher. He's worked extensively in educational policy, management and international development. He is a public speaker and a media commentator. He works internationally as an executive coach and a management and social investment consultant. He's also a frequent contributor to The Guardian. You may well have read some of his articles there on subjects including the Windrush, universities, education, racism in UK institutions and about Britain's relationship with the Caribbean. He's been a prominent figure in the history and ongoing um, Black British education, schooling, uh, publishing and book selling contexts. And he's worked in a number of universities, including the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow and the University of London and Coventry University as well. He is joined by important new activist, poet and writer Yolanda Lear who he mentors. Yolanda Lear is a writer whose book Journey to the Undefeated Mind and her website and the organisation that she runs aims to empower people through the use of creative art, media, music and sport. And you might also find on her website and through her organisation literacy, motivational videos, podcasts and workshops. And she's particularly engaged in supporting people who are uh, battling mental health issues. I'll hand over now to Professor Gus John for an inspiring morning of discussion. Thank you very much and welcome. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've, I've called this session Black Writing in Britain, Finding Your Voice and Using It. Um, Finding your voice is something that my dear late friend and colleague Jane Cortez uh, spoke and wrote about a lot. And I think it is it is uh, uh, apposite for for this particular session. So wh why me? Why why am I at NTU and uh, disturbing your ears this morning? Um, I've had a relationship with NTU as an institution for uh, very many years in different capacities. But this time I'm here because I came across a chapter written by Jenny in 2020 titled Black Writing in Britain, Going Back to Move Forward. And that theme of going back to move forward is one that we in Black Britain um, uh, 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 subscribe to a lot in the sense that we believe it is important to understand uh, how the freedoms we now enjoy were won by the struggles of people before us. Important to understand how our past informs our present and why we need to have regard to both the past and the present in order to forge a better future. So going back to move forward, I think, is a very, a very important uh, uh, way of looking at uh, black writing in Britain. Um, that reson resonated with me and the work I do with some young black people, including uh, young writers, and and Jenny has already uh, introduced my colleague, uh, Yolanda Lear. I mentor them not because I know anything about creative writing, 
or have written except in the capacity of a researcher, social analyst, and newspaper columnist. But I do so because I have an interest in what I call being in the world and how people of any ethnicity in any country and in any age define and make sense of the world and give expression to that. I reached out to Jenny to thank her for her work and say why I was thanking her. I told her of my engagement in decoloniality since I was in a primary school in a tiny village in the island of Grenada, a village of 200 people, um, and how that informed the work I did in conjunction with children of the African diaspora in Oxford in the middle 1960s, when as a student of theology there, I started the first supplementary school in Cowley in East, in East Oxford. How the Black Supplementary Movement we built across Britain and over the ensuing decade, ensuing decades really, um, to build, we built that in order to correct the damage the schooling system was doing to Black children, both by commission and by omission. My point is that that process, um, that process of decolonization um, is something which supplementary schools had to do because the curriculum that black children uh, were being fed um, in that early period and to a large extent even now uh, was Eurocentric, uh, uh, had stereotypes about them and the background and not least of all their ability and, and generally speaking didn't give them a sense of belonging to anywhere or for that matter, they had anything to contribute to schooling and to their white peers in schooling. So my engagement with all of that was informed and enhanced largely by my active engagement with a man called John LaRose and New Beacon Books, a publishing house and book selling venture that he founded with his partner, Sarah White in 1966. I sent Jenny the text of a public lecture I delivered at the British Library in December, 2016 to mark 50 years of New Beacon Books. And I informed her that I was one of the organizers of the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books which ran from 1982 when C.L.R. James delivered the opening lecture to 1995. And I'm sure you, you all know of C.L.R. James. Um, his was one of the earliest uh, uh, novels or, or books written by um, a, a black person that I read, um, Minty Alley. And if you haven't read it yet, you would be rewarded for doing so. On the basis of all that, Jenny perhaps read that I might have something relevant to share with you today. So if you're catapulted out of your comfort zone, or worse yet, if you find this a totally boring and futile experience, be kind to her still. So what do I want to share with you? I want to build upon the work that you already engaged in on your course, individually and collectively, to underscore the fact that decolonization is an ongoing process that we in Black communities have been involved in for decades in order to do the following things. To foreground the contribution of all societies and regions of the world to the evolution of knowledge, to challenge the hegemony of Western epistemologies and language hegemony 
as a critical component of that. And that is why my dear friend Ngugi Wationgo decided to write in Kikuyu as well as in English. And his, his, his works in Kikuyu, which he shares uh, with, with audiences of English speaking people and then translates has got a, a resonance and a tone which actually conveys even if you don't you don't understand the language what he's trying to what he's trying to to, to share the late mahmoud jamal's practice of writing in urdu and reading from works translated into urdu the late kamal brathwaite writing in what he called nation language Linton Kwesi Johnson, who may be more familiar with to most of you, and Benjamin Zephaniah, similarly, plus a number of other writers, such as Ama Atta Aidu, Michere Mugo, Lorna Goodison, Jean Binterbreeze, who passed away not so long ago, Wole Shoinka. All of those people were regular attendees and contributors indeed to the International Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books and the accompanying book fair festival. And finally, to humanize the society and to assist black and global majority children born or raised in Britain in developing a sense of belonging in their own skin and in their own cultural, spiritual, and religious traditions. Some 18 months ago, myself and four other people, including Professor Patricia Rodney, the widow of Dr. Walter Rodney, most of you I hope would know of how Europe underdeveloped Africa, his seminal work. Rodney was assassinated by the regime of Forbes Burnham in his native Guyana in 19, June 1980. We, the people on the, on, 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 on the slide here, established what we call the University of Repair. It's a virtual platform principally, although we run courses and one-off sessions in communities up and down the land. And as you might infer from the name, we seek to engage with individuals and groups in communities in repairing the damage done to our psyche, our self-belief, to our confidence in our self-expression, to our sense of community, and to our cultural, spiritual, and religious traditions, damage done by imperialism and colonialism including the ravages of African enslavement. So who, who, who am I? Who is Gus John? How do I construct my identity? Through what lens do I see the world? How do I experience being in the world? What I am are the following things. African male by the name of Omobowale, which is the Yoruba name, meaning the sun has returned. My ancestors were of the Yoruba people, although I was born in Grenada. And when I was born in Grenada, Africa was born in me, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. I am from the Caribbean, but not of the Caribbean. I am part of the African and Caribbean diaspora in Britain. I am part of the global African diaspora. I am a priest in the Ifa tradition of the Yoruba people of West Africa, a Pan-Africanist committed to the reunification of Africa and its diaspora mentally and spiritually, if not physically. 
in that connection, I have been working as a member of a team of international experts with the African Union on the Sixth Region Project, uh, that project which they started in 2003 is meant to be uniting the continent of Africa with its diaspora across the globe. And of course, I am engaged in the struggle for human liberation. So what am I not? I am not a native of the Caribbean, although born there. And that's not an oxymoron. <laughs> I am not an ethnic minority, please. I am not a BAME, please. I am not a person of color, please. And I'm also not of the Windrush generation. So if I was born in Grenada, how come I am not of the Caribbean? If there is one thing history has taught us, it is that all empires thrive and expand through barbarism and genocide. That characterized the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Mongol Empire, the Russian Empire, the British Empire, and more. The Caribbean people, the natives of the Caribbean, were exterminated like a plague of rats. Caribs, Arawaks, Amerindians, Mayans. Our ancestors, my ancestors, were transported there to replace them. And like people do everywhere, we, they, adapted to our brutal environment and preserved our heritage as best we could. But our ancestry traveled with us, both in our genes and in our spiritual architecture. And by that I mean our ancestors, those who were enslaved, had ancestors in the countries from which they came, uh, Nigeria, the Congo, wherever. Um, and those ancestors didn't die or stay. The spirit of those ancestors did not evaporate or vanish at the point at which those, their forebears were placed in the hold of slave ships and brought to the Americas. So that, at least in terms of my belief, that ancestry and those ancestral spirits stayed with us uh, in our enslavement. And it is, it is in that sense that African, Africa was born in me. And I dare to suggest that, but for them and for that fundamental instinct for freedom that we as human beings all share, we as a people would not have survived enslavement. So part of the repair we do is to assist those Caribbean people who protest vehemently about being called African to examine that mindset and what it is constructed upon. I address you today as the director of New Beacon Books, which I mentioned earlier, started by John LaRose. John was my mentor and his home in Albert Road in Finsbury Park and the New Beacon Bookshop, a short distance from his home, were effectively my university. Before I met John and enjoyed the privilege of sitting at his feet to learn and to unlearn, my university education had simply reinforced the British colonial and Eurocentric education I had received in Grenada and Trinidad. Growing up in those places, and I was dispatched to my aunt in Trinidad when my mother left me to come and join my father and older brother in London in 1960. When I was left there and when I grew up in those two places, I had precious little exposure to literature in English written by Caribbean authors. 
And talking about left behind, let me just digress for a moment. You are no doubt aware of that Windrush monument in Waterloo Station, which was placed there in June of last year on Windrush Day. The statue which depicts a Caribbean couple arriving in London carrying suitcases and then accompanied by a little girl. For me, this epitomizes the falsehood that is the Windrush narrative. Those who came typically arrived much later after parents had found accommodation and jobs and could send money home so that the children could join them. Between 1971 and 1973, as a research social worker in Manchester, for example, I worked with a caseload of 26 Caribbean families, all of whom were experiencing acute problems associated with the trauma young children were suffering as a result of being uprooted from those whom they regarded as their real parents to come and join their biological parents with whom they had no bond or effective relationship of any sort. So the notion that the Windrush and, and those who came on it were parents and young children is falsifying the history of the emigration from the Caribbean to, 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 to this place. I've been associated with New Beacon Books and the Caribbean Artists Movement since 1966. That experience enables me to help others understand the critical role publishers such as New Beacon, Bogle Louverture Publications, and Allison and Busby, the critical role they played in building what I call the Black Resistance Movement in Britain, as well as playing a pivotal role in the much narrower agenda to promote multicultural education and later anti-racist education in schools, teacher training, further education, and higher education. I left Trinidad and Grenada for Britain in 1964 Throughout my 15 years of schooling, prior to that, I had read Gerald Durrell, Thomas Hardy, Charles Dickens, William Wordsworth, William Shakespeare, Edgar Allan Poe, W.E. Johns, and I love Biggles, Jane Austen, Enid Blyton, E.M. Foster, Shelley Keats, Tennyson, and many more in the so-called canon of English literature. But I could count on one hand, literally, only on one hand, the Caribbean writers I had read, George Lamming, Sylvia Winter, C.L.R. James, Edgar Mittelholzer, and V.S. Naipaul. And talking about Naipaul, he did the least amongst those a lot in terms of decolonization, but that's for another conversation. Every single one of them left the Caribbean for Britain or North America in order to pursue their career, write for a much larger readership and become part of liter literary circles where the work could be acknowledged, critiqued, and disseminated on its own merit. Their numbers grew in Britain and in North America, but they remained in the wilderness, so to say, for a number of reasons. In the 1960s and 70s, we depended heavily on the Heinemann Writers series, and if you're not familiar with those, you should look it up because they played a major role in that space at that time. We depended on Heinemann Writer Series 
to find literature written by black writers from the African continent and the African diaspora. It is that expansive void that visionaries such as Margaret Busby of Allison and Busby and John LaRose of New Beacon Books sought to fill. The significance of New Beacon Books and the Caribbean artist movement, both established in 1966, is what is that while mainstream publishers were turning down the work of black writers, arguing that there was not a market for that sort of thing, it was to independent black publishers such as New Beacon and Bogle Louverture that many of those authors turned to have their work published and made available both to the growing African diaspora in Britain, but as importantly, to the white British population. It was important that children in schools knew that black people could write and had written books, not just literature. Uh, some of the, 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 the biggest names in mathematics, in engineering, in science uh, were African people. The role those authors played and those publishers played in providing literature for the multicultural education curriculum, for special access courses, for the further and higher education curriculum, and for the growing supplementary education movement cannot be overstated. To a large extent, they paved the way for the likes of Virago, Women's Press, and many other publishers of that generation. And much later, for the likes of Career Press, Karnak Books, and currently People Tree Books. New Beacon, Bogolovitio, and others were pioneers in a number of respects. They were pioneers in community education and in promoting non formal and informal education. They pioneered decolonization and the challenge to hegemonic Western epistemologies, which shaped the production, validation, and dissemination of knowledge. And in this regard, let me say this. I was one of those activists and indeed uh, 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 social analyst, analysts who protested vehemently against the likes of Hans Isink, uh, Charles Murray, uh, Cyril Britt. Um, these were eugenicists who were all arguing what I called biological racism. They were indulging in biological racism in that they were expounding theories which said that black people were inferior in intelligence to white people and that that is why their underachievement in education and schooling particularly uh, was 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 as it was believe it or not that kind of garbage was being taught in teacher education settings teacher training colleges would use that sort of literature and teachers were being effectively encouraged to believe that they shouldn't have high expectations of black children because genetically they were inferior in intelligence. So part of the repair we do in the University of Repair is to assist those Caribbean people who protest vehemently about calling themselves African to examine that mindset and that history that I have just told you about. But New Beacon and Bogle Louverture also demystified writing and literature and underscored the symbiotic relationship between culture and politics, and especially the role of culture in political resistance to oppression, deracination, and erasure. Above all, they positioned literature and writers at the heart 
of, of communities and the self-organization. Imagine, for example, being able to gather as a school student or a college student or youths from a youth club in, 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 in London, being able to gather in New Beacon Bookshop or at Bogo Louverture and hear Sam Selvan, Kamar Brathwaite, Andrew Salkey, Sylvia Winter, Lorna, Good Lorna Goodison, Merle Collins, Valerie Bloom, Grace Nichols, and many others read and discuss their work. A life-changing experience for many young people and a once-in-a-lifetime experience for many. So this is the context in which in 1981, in the wake of the New Cross massacre, the Black People's Day of Action that followed it, and the mass uprisings in cities across the land, London, Bristol, Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, we decided to organize the first international book fair of radical Black and third world books. The book fair brought together publishers, writers, artists, and cultural activists from across five continents and was held in London, Manchester, and Bradford. So how did we manage to bring those people together? We did so because in addition to selling books and publishing books, both Bogo Louverture and New Beacon had a keen interest and indeed engagement with the struggles of Black working class people and the workers' movement generally in countries across the five continents. Um, in London, for example, we formed the Committee Against Political Repression in Kenya. We campaigned for the release of the writer Ngugi Wationgo from prison um, and against the, 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 the tyranny uh, of Daniel Arab Moy, the, the president of that country. We campaigned in relation to the workers' movement in the Caribbean and the way in which capital was still expecting the descendants of enslaved Africans to work on plantations under conditions that were not very dissimilar from what they had during enslavement. So our engagement with these struggles, the liberation struggles in South Africa, uh, across Southern Africa, Mozambique, Namibia, and so forth. And the struggles, of course, of people in the United States of America. That enabled us to call on colleagues in those places to come to London, to share their experiences, bring the publications to the book fair. And so that is what made the book need, the book bazaar, such a rich experience. So that those attending could hear from people from across the world effectively, discussing not just political activism, but literature and writing and, and the, 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 the impact of uh, colonial education, ambitions, and, and, and so on. So it's important to state, to state that because it, it, it's, it's, it, it wasn't just that we had uh, people from different publishers coming and, 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 and um, selling books in itself was a movement, a movement of cultural and political activists from across the five continents. So how did higher education position itself 
with respect to these historical developments. I think it is fair to say that in response to demands for de there is an open debate in the HE sector about knowledge production, validation and exchange as distinct from knowledge transfer. The marginalization of non-Western epistemologies, cultural products and pedagogy is still rife in the HE sector in Britain. Ironically, the of that sector upon income from international students and despite the expansion of online teaching. So as far as I am concerned, the higher education sector is complicit in the failure of Britain to see of empire and tackle the reasons at the core of it. This manifests itself in a variety of ways to the disservice of white and global majority students alike. Let me share one anecdote that in my view is a classic illustration of what I mean. While contributing to Steve McQueen's Small Acts series a couple of years ago, and some of you would have seen those films, I was interviewed by an enormously talented black graduate with whom I shared notes about my journey with New Beacon books, etc. And then I chanced to ask her what she studied at university. And she told me she read English literature. I then asked her quite innocently and in no way meaning it to be a trick question. Do you mean English literature or literature in English? She looked very puzzled. And after, after a pause, she asked me, what's the difference? So here was a black woman, Gree, from a prestigious Russell Group institution, asking me to explain that difference, which I did. On further probing, I discovered that the only books outside the English canon she had studied on her entire course was Adichie's Son and Achebe's Trilogy. Things fall apart, no, no longer at ease, error of God. This is why I say, my friends, there is a huge amount of repairing to be done. And not just in relation to African people, the African diaspora, particularly, and the damage done to us by colonialism and imperialism, a damage which, which continues through neocolonialism, I might add. But for white people, there needs to be that repair. Because you see, the way in which the British dealt with our presence from the beginning was to suggest, so to suggest that somehow we were an aberration. The norm is whiteness. Britishness equals right, whiteness. And therefore, white people need do, to do nothing about themselves. And that is why, that's the context in which that very strange practice called racism awareness training came about and became an industry between 1970, let's see, and, 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 and 1990, 1995. So, as we say in the University of Repair, we need to tackle the, we need to, repair the mindsets and we do so only by taking effective measures to prevent repetition of harm and of hurt. 
no one but no one should be expected to efface that on which they frame their identity and their sense of belonging belonging to a world in which everyone has worth in which everyone has the right to give full expression to their creativity and creative imagination no one should should have to face all of that in order to be validated and to be given a mark of excellence preventing repetition is an imperative for all phases of education i would argue from day nursery to university mark twain had good reason to avow that he never let his schooling interfere with his education in this sense then one can argue that the black saturday or supplementary was driven by the need to ensure black children's schooling did not interfere with their education and mess up their heads. I truly despair, my friends, when I hear dunderheads such as Michael Gove, Kemi Badenoch, and Gavin Williamson telling schools and experienced self-respecting teachers what they should and should not teach children, what they define as the canon of English literature, what is acceptable to teach about race and what is not, about race, about race in society, and about race and the state. So that is why I applaud what you are doing on this course and what Jenny is facilitating you and you are facilitating one another to discover and to express. One can only hope that this approach permeates and defines the approach to curriculum and pedagogy to teaching and learning across the institution as a whole. And I would want to argue that it isn't just curriculum, because in my view, you, you cannot decolonize the curriculum unless you set about decolonizing the institution. Curriculum, but the institutional practices and culture and barriers be there constraining black people expression and their advancement and pursuit of their aspirations but they can also constrain white people in the sense that i mentioned before i.e what is the role of higher education in tackling the legacy of empire and what, what, how does higher education join up the pursuit of racial justice, of social justice, adding to that, of course, climate justice? Because for many of the people that are being taught in our institutions, whether they are of the African and Asian diaspora here in Britain, or they, are, they have come from those countries to our institutions. For them, climate justice is a life and death matter. And it seems to me, if we continue as we're doing, and our systems, our institutions, the way they're organized, the way they approach teaching and learning and, and what have you, um, um, don't, engage with those is doing not just those students but the society and the world a massive disservice now it is my very great pleasure to leave you, to leave you in the capable hands of my dynamic young sister
hope it was the same for everyone else on the call. Um, I'm literally just going to be sharing some, a few poems, spoken word pieces written. Um, as mentioned, I do a lot of activism work, both within the mental health side. Not only does it scrutinise the police, but we also teach young people about their rights. Um, and it's developing more into a move movement in fighting against police injustice. So a lot of um, the spoken word that I do is based around that as well. So just give you an extra bit of history. kind of challenge to tell my story um, and we had to incorporate music which I'm not going to be playing the music today because that's just extra long but we had to use music to tell our story and like the song we had to find songs that represent us in a sense And it's kind of, as I said, my story and how I got into activism, basically. Cool. I'm reading it off my phone. Just to warn you, so I'm not, like, looking away. I don't remember it off the top of my head, so apologies. I'll be doing that with all of the poems that I share. Can you hear me clearly as well, um, just for the stream? I was never alone. <clears throat> I was told that Jesus loves me and he has the whole world in his hands. My grandma would sing these songs on the regular, though she therefore wasn't the best singer. It was always the message that counts. And the song that stuck out the most was this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Though back then, I didn't know what that meant. Though the seed had already been planted and I guess it took for life to water it. Growing up, I was told I had an old soul. I was called the prayer warrior, in tune with the spiritual. I guess that's why I'm in love with music, because they said that music is the language of the soul. And in my family's household, that was definitely so. From the side of the silk, my ears were constantly blessed. So I guess it makes sense why I think most of this modern music is trash just a fun fact remember that song that my grandma would sing he has the whole american spiritual song yeah i was only told the western version but that seems to be a common trait in history we create something then all of a sudden there's a new western discovery take rock and roll for example they will tell you that elvis presley was the king of rock Of rock, a known founder, founder of rock and roll. We don't talk about her. It's a name that not many people know. Is it because she's black? Is it because she's a sister? Life was imbalanced. I couldn't quite explain it. I just felt it. I would see the wars and the news and all the pain in people. I'm an empath. I feel every emotion. All the pain in people felt like, like I was carrying the world. But I couldn't quite explain that I was 
the hurt in my soul, which is part of the reasons I don't like crowds, because if you know, then you know, energy's real, i got to protect my crown, but sometimes the noise is loud, even when I'm by myself, which is why I'm so thankful for my granddad, he introduced me to jazz. of a voiceless community but jazz gave them a voice jazz gave them a voice when silenced by society mr masakela wrote a song called soweto blues speaking on the soweto uprisings in 1976 around 20,000 children protesting the decision in south africa to make african studied in schools Although Soweto Blues was written and produced by Hughes Masakero, it was sung by a novel, Queen Miriam Makero. Being introduced to them by my granddad and my mum, it opened my eyes to exactly what words can do. It's artists like them that gave license to someone like me to use my words and allowing our unsung truth to be We know that music holds powers, but so does your words. They say, and I, I remember, I said I feel every emotion. So when words go, inside me. Everything I was writing was a reflection of my depression. You see, in 2011, I lost my aunt to cancer. New Year's Day, my cousin got killed. That was on his birthday. And in nine months, my baby cousin passed. Year after year, another person passed. All the pain that I felt, plus what was going on in the world, there was only there was one song that I felt like the anthem best suited the times that we were in. It's a song by a Jamaican artist named Egyptian. He speaks on how the times you were in are serious times. Now I want to take, yeah, I want you to take a hold of the fact that that song was written in 2006. You see, at the time, street violence, young black kings were constantly losing their lives. We would hear about the state murders in America. I was aware of the hardships of the world. I couldn't tune it out. It was, it became impossible to dis- Everyone else seemed to do it with ease, but not me. It would burn me mentally. I knew I had to do, do something, but if I stay, although I'd say, then if I stay silent, I'm just as bad as those who are making the world turn mad five years straight without being able to explain just how I felt just what I saw it felt like I was the only one who could not ignore now in 2017 maybe I'm not when the death of Rashawn Charles happened it confirmed we were in some serious times people were saying that Rashawn caused his own death but I saw the footage the original one it was over 20 minutes long. They did him so wrong. Yet still, no justice. Myself. Dig deep in my traumas and uproot them. That part of my journey was so emotional, so painful, so hard, but yet I came out feeling so blessed, so thankful, so humbled by life, a sense of purpose. I knew how to use my voice. I found a workplace that understood how I felt, allowed me to express all my pain, frustrations I was feeling about the world. 
like I had none. And when the pandemic hit, a lockdown, so they gave me a voice when I felt like I had none. And when the world was forced to stand still, when the pandemic removed, my undefeated mind. With this, I felt power to change the world, to bring back humanity, integrity, love and honour, to respect one another. Through this, we can begin to change the world. But to do this, we need to focus on our simple blessings in life. We tend to overcomplicate it. Our exp uh, say, our ex with everyone people's life like it's our own, so much that we forget to live our own. So the message I want to give you all is love the life that you live and live the life that you love. That's the end of that poem. Straight into the other one. Um, which one should I share? I'm gonna do this one. So this one is based on the child Q incident. I'm sure most of you are aware of the child queue incident. I'm not going to go into it because it is quite triggering. Um, doesn't work. So when this incident actually happens, um, my workplace, the team that I work with, which is called Account, we put on a community meeting which held about a hundred and majority of those people and one have a space to rant about this but also have a space to build solutions and how we can move forward and ensure things like this doesn't happen but also allow the community to know that they're not alone. We stand with you. The Met Police came out and gave an apology upon your own. Because violation after violation, you constantly fail to safeguard our children, leaving them with people. much mental pain that it makes it that make it hard to reach your services but upon your services my people it's our time because we've got so much holistic remedies and love being the main ingredients that goes in absolutely everything see this is the century of action the generation of no holding back because we're tired of begging the system to see us why do we even have to ask to be treated equally that should come naturally but unfortunately, it's on a regular. Our children can't go to school. They ain't protected by the system. First seen as suspects rather than victims. We can't talk on the injustice because apparently we're playing the race card. And rage is overdue. That's why they over police our ends now. But can't keep. But we can't keep giving them what they expect. We gotta come different with our next steps. Intergenerational community flex. And like I said, love has gotta be at the core of it. Not for money or fame, trends or gains. Cause this is our children, our elders, our people. It's time that we're all seen as equal. One voice when we stand up. We are the people. That's the end of that one. It was a short one. Um I'm gonna do so I can share a few more. So I'm gonna do another one. I wrote this one, I think I was like 16 or 17. It explains the mindset that I was in to, to write it in the first place. 
and this one's called Why Do You Fear Us? <clears throat> Why do you fear us? Is it the darker shades of our skin or the way our hair flows in the wind? Tell me. Tell me, is it danger we bring? Or is it... And you're afraid that one, one day we might raise a revolution or are you scared? Scared because my people can create little of our life we are taught to follow. I still do not understand why your love for us can be so narrow. You see, when I was in But why? Why do you fear us? Is it because of my people's ability to rise? Each time we try to break us in our strive, it's got me asking when I, I mean, if we strip us of our colours, we are both alike, right? So why do you fear us? Is it because we don't flinch when you're near us, regardless of our history? <clears throat> or because of our history, you think we'll switch eventually? Or is it because we can switch from Martin to Malcolm in a split second and you won't even see it coming? Is that why you fear us? I know some of you are great, but to the ones who ain't, I ask you why. Why do you fear us? Is it the darker shade? of our skin or the way your hair flows in the wind tell me tell me is it dangerous those rings blings and materialistic things and soon they will see that they are kings queens and they won't stand for none of these things is that why you fear us or is it because my people pose a knowledge that you do not understand and you're afraid that one day we might raise a revolution or are you scared? Scared because my people can create leaders even though most of our life we are taught to follow. I still do not understand why your love for us can be so narrow. Or is it because of the darker shades of our skin or the way our hair flows in the wind? Tell me, tell me, is it danger we bring? I got to question the Man in a group of more than three, I'm no longer surprised when they're circled. A criminal you see, and I see free. And all, all they want is just to be free. I mean, all we want is just to be free, just to be seen, recognized, and rewarded. In fact, we just want peace, just leave us be. But in 2023, I'm still asking why. Why do you fear us? Near us. Just because we're loud doesn't mean we're terrors. We're expressive with our words because it comes from the heart. So why? Why do you fear us? Is it because of... I think that maybe we're just hurting. Generational curses are real because for generations my people haven't healed, so I ask you where culture you love to indulge in, yet still the playing fields are un uneven. Is it because of the darker shades of our skin or the way our hair flows in the wind? Tell me, is it danger we bring? And now they got a new term, adultification, where they claim to see our young children as older than they are difference we're all the same in their eyes but if you really saw us you would see the pain in our eyes so i ask you why why do you fear us that's the end of that one and then i'm going to share one more this one's a bit more uplifting and again this one um to give a little bit of history behind it. I wrote this for Black History Month, but I'm 
for Black History Month where I brought quite a few community leaders, individuals that are doing a lot of amazing things within the community and we just basically celebrated them. So we had an exhibition of their pictures and um, a little explanation of what straight into it rather than try and break it down even more. Cool. Um, as I said, it's called Lifting Up Royalty. I stand in the presence of greatness, blessed by royalty. I don't really care too much about celebrities those walk beside me. Integrated in our communities, you gave me the green light to let my light shine so I can shine light on you guys because others need to know that they walk amongst royalty. Put down the gloves because done with the fight. Emotions bubbling up, you wanna scream or cry? My advice is, scream or cry. There's too many lives to put the gloves down now. Even in the simplest act, like making someone smile. Life changing, cause you don't know how they really felt. There's power in the smile. It helps the internal heal. race this is your path go at your pace if you need to rest then rest reflect recuperate then refresh refresh your mind because how can you guide others if your mind is a but when you're ready to go then get up and go but remember this ain't a race You ain't got time to be a hero because even soldiers need nurses, cooks, cleaners, and helpers. Without them, I don't know how many lives you've gone on to change indirectly because you don't know how many lives that one will go on to change. You see, it takes a village to raise a child. There's power in community, power in unity. I'm blessed to walk amongst you all. And though the fight is far, far from over, I want you to know that the works you do, it's not hidden under a shelter. We see you, love and respect you. This, this next bit, you don't have to do it because um, there's quite a few of us and we're online. But basically, I give you guys some affirmations to say. So you can say it in your heads. If you want, you can, I want, it's completely down to you. But I do say, now if you can, please repeat these next few lines after me. I am blessed. I am beautiful. I will continue to spread and accept love. I will continue to let my light shine will continue to show others that they can shine their light and I will continue to be my authentic self because I am royalty. And before I end, remember this poem. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Yolanda. That was wonderful. So rich and fascinating. So passionate and thoughtful. Um, in a few seconds, um, I hope we'll have lots of questions for Yolanda from the students who are present, but I thought I might start while they're thinking of formulating a question with a first question for you. Um, and it's in response to your first poem. And I was so 
I was constantly inspired by all of the different references that you brought to that poem. Some of it was um, political history, world history, global history. Some of it was probably family history, memories. Um, it's It was expansive and captivating and such a rich collection of kind of sources that you brought together. So I just wanted to ask you, um, how do you do research when you're writing a poem? Or what does research for your poetry mean for you? That was remember like some of those um in there i didn't remember those particular eyes but i remember the song or the album that my mum would play in in the car going wherever we were going so it was a, a mixture of that and then when i found the particular song so like he's massacre he's got a ton of different songs that i wanted to use but given the time i was like let me let me just pick one um, do a bit of research on the history. So some of the things I was aware of, but some things I wasn't a hundred percent aware of. Watch interviews on YouTube, uh, just getting a sense of the history and the emotion at that time as well. Doing that, I was able to pick like the right songs for with the emotions that I wanted to portray and the history and the knowledge that I wanted to, to give off in that particular poem. Um, it's, as I said, just about finding what it is that I want to talk about and then finding the information that kind of backs what, um, yeah, backs what I'm saying in my poem. So mm -hmm. there was another one that I didn't share today, but it's called um, Hackney's Ain't Innocent, and that was based on um, anyone really talk about what happens in the UK. And as I mentioned, that my workplace account where currently we're going independent but we're currently hackney based so everything that um, we did was focused on hackney so regarding um deaths in custody and police negligence so yeah there's, there's a lot of youtube google speaking to family everything listening to music that's tend to be my favorite one because i love music yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I've, I've got a song I was going to recommend as well, inspired by that. I've, it doesn't take me much to recommend songs to people. Um, there's a song by um, a band called The Noisettes, and it's called Sister Rosetta, Capture the Spirit. So um, you might want to listen to that. I love it. It's one of my favourite songs. <laughs> it's just made me think of it when you were reading your poem. Um, just one thing to kind of um, follow on from your response there. I think that's really important for especially for students present in the session to remember that although you deliver the poem as if it was um, your own kind of particular um, kind of bi biographical history, when you talked about doing the research, you talked about constructing the, the songs for the message that you wanted to tell. And that's a really, uh, it's a, a constant kind of discussion and debate, especially in black writing in Britain, the, the fact that often it comes across as being a kind of, um, kind of instinctive um, piece of literature but it's a it's a creative constructed um piece of art just like any other literature it's interesting that um even in a poem which is so personal um that's the case with your research okay uh, the first question that we um have for you is from valentina and she asks when did you start writing in general she mentions that the second poem you read um you wrote at the age of 16 and she asks whether you've always been interested in writing um question when did I, I think i was about 
probably about 15, 14, 15, like late 14. To be honest, I didn't always have like an interest in, in writing. Um, I was a late bloomer when it actually came to, to writing. So growing up, I moved around schools um, a few times. So I was a bit behind, but I had a teacher in my primary school actually who kind of saw the potential. So she would always put me aside and do like extra lessons, extra tutoring. And I somewhat developed a, a passion for writing then, but I didn't really think I was I was that good at it. So I, I didn't do much with it. But then when I wrote my first, I would say, song slash poem, um, it was actually off the back of like really negative emotions. So I had a really um, frustrating, this way to put it, conversation with my dad on MSN, if you guys know about MSN, but on MSN, um, and I just remembered feeling so like angry and frustrated and I didn't know where to put that emotion. I was always a child that hated feeling like that. So I was quite, I would always seclude myself from like family. So I, I remember just going off into my bedroom and out of nowhere, just a whole heap of words just came out of my mouth, which all made sense. Um, and I thought it was amazing. But I'd, I, by the time it got to me writing it, I had forgotten everything. So then I, I basically just tried to sit down and write it again. And writing was very, say, negative, but based, um, stemmed from a lot of depression, best way to put it. Like it wasn't, it wasn't anything that I would personally release right now. So it was more just a case of getting it off my, my head because I didn't really writing more seriously I would probably say between 2019 and 2020 so I actually released my book in 2020 around that 2019 period that's when I connected with where I'm working currently and they gave me that creative Thank you. Um, a question about your kind of practical work then from Rebecca next. Um, she asks whether the organisation that you work for has a, a wider national base and whether or not are there any ways for people to get involved? Perhaps she would like to get involved or some of the other students here would like to get involved. We're kind of in a transition mode at the moment. So where we are currently we're under an organization called Hackney CVS um, which or national based and get everyone involved so I can send over um, whatever information to yourself On that. <clears throat> if anyone would want to get involved, even if you want to be speakers or anything, like I'll send my email. For you. You've got my email now, um, Jenny. So okay, I'll pass on that information. You can share it with everyone else and share my email. So if they are interested in getting involved, then you can collect them as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Maria asks um, about two things. I'll perhaps. Um, I'll, I'll ask her first question first. So she says that recently in, in our Black Writing in Britain seminars, um, we've been reading texts that talk about how because of the few opportunities that black filmmakers, writers and artists had, especially in the 1970s and 80s, um, they stopped being seen as individuals and had to become representatives of their community or culture. We talk about the, you know, the burden of representation. And she asks um, whether 
this view of artists as representatives, as the voice of a community rather than an individual expressing their own reality still rings true either for you or maybe for some of your colleagues that you that you can uh, mention? Um, yeah, I'll probably say it does still ring true. haven't got a lot that generally represent us especially in a in a good manner anyway um in that kind of saying because i feel like we don't We've got a lot of people that represent us as successful black people, but we haven't got a lot of people that represent the black community as who we are culturally. Um, if that makes sense, like a lot of people, once they generally become successful, they tend to part ways with the community or there isn't always um, a true representation of the culture and the coming together and all of that within the community it tends to only highlight particular issues or particular say violence and that that happens within our community so i as i said i thrive in the opportunity to be able to be that voice and represent our community in a different way um it is hard to be an individual in that space though but you know it's about how you use that space um i always say like your voice is powerful your words are powerful and when you're able to utilize those things in particular you now have a, a level of power that other people within the community don't necessarily have so how you use it is always vital um so if you can represent represent in in the best way possible just hope that answers that question Really interesting. Thank you. I think that'll be lots of food for thought in seminars for us to continue that conversation about the burden of representation too. Thank you. Um, a really kind of uh, practical question from Eleanor. Um, she asks, well, she says, firstly, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's amazing. We've had lots of positive comments in the chat as well about how inspiring your poetry is. She asks, um, do you categorise your work um, by subject or topic when you publish it or organize it in another way do you deliberately place the poems in a specific order or do you read them aloud in performance in a specific order and um, maybe you could talk about the process um i'm probably the worst person to answer that question because i write it on my phone and i just leave it there like um i don't do a lot with my my poetry or my writing that is something that i am trying to do a lot more um, in terms of that, yeah, for instance, the order I'll perform it, it depends on, I guess, the room I'm in or the, the subject of, of the day. Um, as you notice, I try to leave the more uplifting and empowering one to towards the end because it's a heavy, I don't want to say burden, but it's, it's, a, he it's, it's a lot of weight to carry um, and it's some of the things that to start with so I, I try to end on a more positive note um, that's usually how I, I like to lead it even with like my poems if it is um, a heavy hitting subject I try to happen we just have to come together and, and unite and doesn't matter about where we come from or what we look like it's all about us just kind of coming together and utilizing our skill sets as one so i think that's the main thing that i do think about but in terms of publishing and everything else that's something i need to get better at and actually do stuff with my poems because they're just sitting on my phone at the moment yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. Um, one more for you for now, and then Professor Gus John will be joining us for the Q&A as well, and then questions can be directed to, to both of you at that point. Um, so this question is from Pablo, and he asks about the process of writing your poems and whether it's the same for all of them. For instance, do you write in one burst or do you write over a period of days or weeks or, or months? What's your writing process? Um, it's nine times out of ten, it's usually one burst. Um, like as of recently, I tend to write for the occasion. So these ones I've I've shared are, are ones that's already been on my phone. But um, as I mentioned, the first one. I find that I can't write no more, but I know that it's not finished, so I'll leave it. And when I do get that inspiration or um, that burst comes back again, I'll go back to it and I might write like a ton more and add to it. Um, but yeah, I, I try not to force it because I feel like when you force something to happen, it you don't get the best of yourself. Um, even when like out, Right in my book, for instance, it's, it's the same. Well, maybe not that book in particular, because that happened in like two weeks. But um, the book that I'm currently working on, like I find that I don't have the same drive that I have when I, I first wrote my first one. So I, I just leave it little by little and I'll, I'll come back to it. And yeah, just make sure I'm giving the best to it. Because as I said, when it's forced, um, you leave out the best message and the reader can obviously get that as well I don't know if you've ever read a book when you're reading something and you can tell that someone's heart and passion isn't necessarily in it but they're writing it because they've got a deadline or something like that so I try not to give I, I give myself like a vague deadline but I don't force creativity to happen yeah, de deadlines, a very interesting question. I'm sure lots of the students will be thinking about deadlines and I'm always thinking about deadlines and I agree with you completely. But work deadlines, uni deadlines. Yeah. Make sure you don't have that. I'm not going to tell you don't have that, but yeah. <laughs> outside of uni, let the creativity just flow. Don't force it. That um, leads on nicely to a question that I wanted to ask Gus John while others are thinking of questions for him. Um, I was I wondered about your kind of concept of the university. You talk a lot about the university. You talk about the University of Repair. You talk about New Beacon Books being effectively your university. You talk about the process of learning and unlearning. You talk about the higher education sector being complicit in Britain's failure to confront the legacy of empire and tackle the racism that remains at the core of it. And I wondered if you could say what you think the university should do? What should be the function of university? Yeah, it's a, a massive question, but perhaps <laughs> you can respond to it. Um, it, it's a it's a quite important question, Jenny. Um, uh, but, but first of all, let me let, let me let me tell you what what worries me intensely. Um, uh, I know that universities operate within a cultural space, an educational space, a political space, indeed. Uh, but it seems to me that the more they become aligned with political culture as generated by or defined by government, um, they've lost the plot. Um, institutions of higher learning must necessarily In 1977, I started in 
1977. Okay. Um, and before that, of course, I'd been a student and so on. Um, what I have witnessed over those decades is the extent to which rather that sort of collective of leaders of, 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 of the sector, rather than critique and all that kind of stuff as Britain is, um, the whole sector seems to have embraced neoliberalism with a passion, right? <laughs> Now, some people might say there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But as far as I'm concerned, if you, if you don't have a focus on the role of education in liberating people, human liberation and liberating people, a focus on what the role of an institution such as that is in promoting social justice and the context within which that arises, you know, capitalism, post-imperialism and, and, and what have you, then you become part of the problem. And if you're a conduit for people to gain qualifications and, and what have you, to then go out there and be leaders, whether it be leaders of industry or, 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 or health service or um, um, government services, whatever. It means that you are perpetuating a system. Um, I could never understand, for example, why in this millennium, you have a situation where practically all of these universities have got senior leadership teams people who came of, of my generation, my parents' generation and my generation, um, didn't come to, to, to start. Allows for people to go through the hoops and become leaders and, and magnates and what have you, without them understanding anything whatsoever about oppression, about gender oppression, about whatever it is. And that's part of the reason why do not have a good track record in terms of simply, well, it's not simple, but meeting the public public sector equality duty of the Equality Act 2010. This race charter, for example, that universities chase, they want bronze, they want silver, they want gold, whatever. I don't know what any of them has ever achieved gold. Um, it's, 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 it's interesting that so many fail to get onto the first rung of the ladder. They don't get even bronze because what's going on in the institutions is so utterly deplorable right so 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 my 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 point is that the sector itself has got to reset and ask questions about what is its societal function and i i was given a, 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 a honorary doctorate of higher education to simply recycle elitism. You know, that, that, that cannot be its function. Um, so, so we have to talk about 
allowing people to 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 realize their ambitions we've got to talk about building a future society and 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 building leaders of that future society so we we need to know what vision do we have of those, that society what do we want it to become you know we we're not just about turning out uh, 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 people who are fodder for capitalism or leaders of capitalism um and and so the, the sector worries me phenomenally. I've been involved in it for God knows five decades or whatever it is. But it, it worries me for all of those reasons. And, and it gets worse. Get a government to, 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 to adopt the prevent program without critiquing what that means and how it is to be delivered. And, and more recently, we've had government and 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 is happy to say we have adopted it no but what the hell is that about um so are the sect is the sector not also in, interested in human rights for Palestinians? I mean, so, so you get my point. It, what I'm saying is it, it, it fails to be A long answer, but it's a complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions. Maybe we'll start with one which is quite connected to your response to that one. Um, Pablo asks um, how we start the repairing process that you talk about. Does it happen in the individual um, or perhaps elsewhere? But for me, I think it has to start with the individual. Um, uh, we have to we have to examine ourselves. We are socialized within particular cultures, um, and we can either stay within that unquestioningly, or ask certain questions about it. Okay, I I am a man, right? Um, I, I had to do a lot of work on myself in terms of the sexist culture within which I was socialized, okay? And, and it was important for me to do that because I wanted my children to see me as a feminist and to understand what, how they take personal responsibility for the conduct. I've got two sons, I've got four daughters. How do they take responsibility for themselves as men and as women? And as women determining what they will and would not put up with from any damned man, right? So, so I had to take responsibility for that. And, and within myself, be sufficiently foot sure about who I was, how I was relating to those matters, the unlearning that I needed to do in order to lay the foundations for them as a parent. So it has to begin with the person, and and then it, we we have to think in terms of th there are group identities, all right? Okay, as 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 a group, as a collective, you can see black people. By some racist individual or group. Uh, irrespective of your standing or, or who you are, um, what people see is the fact that you're black, okay? And that goes for the police. So, so when some um, uh, Olympic athlete at 
etc being stopped and searched and the police treating them in in in, in vile ways And, and going about the business, irrespective of how expensive the vehicle might look. So, so, so it seems to me that schooling we are compelled by law to send our children to, right? So one of the tasks as, as a particularly a black parent or a white parent of black children, more to the point, is to, is to ensure you know how that whole system works. What is that, what is that culture like? Encourage children to talk about it so that you can help them with the strategies, but flourishing within those environments. So I think it has to begin with the individual. And, and 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 then that together more powerful and impactful thank you um i've had a question which has come to my email and this is about your concept of the pan-africanist and the reunification of africa and its diaspora mm -hmm. and i wonder whether that is relevant and related to what you've been talking about and whether you could talk about maybe one of the strategies that you are employing or should be employed to start this process or to encourage the process yes i mean again that that happens at both a a a, 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 a micro and a macro level as you can imagine um uh the 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 whole program the six region agenda has stalled to a large extent because there are leaders on the african continent who okay they are xenophobic to a certain extent um and 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 they use examples for example of of, of south africa uh, and zimbabwe and people in that southern africa area who have um gone to South Africa, especially since 1994, uh, and, and the, the state has not effectively dealt with their presence particularly well, all right? So there are people who are concerned about what this sixth region um, might mean and how practically it, it would actually work. Because you've got countries in West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, South Africa, whatever, um, then you have the diaspora, African people in North America, African people in the Caribbean, African people in Latin America, and so on. So but what, what strategies and processes do you use to, to make that a unified group that you call the six regions? for individual countries like Jamaica, Trinidad, uh, Costa Rica, Colombia, whatever. What does it mean for the African diaspora here in Britain? And how do you begin to, to frame an agenda in a place where you are not, you, you're not the majority population like in Jamaica or wherever as, as the African does it set for you within this metropolis in terms of government's attitude towards the debt crisis towards uh, climate change towards um, 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 the, the the recolonization of africa whether it be by china or whoever else so th there are there are huge complex questions 
But then at, at a more micro level, there were there were things like what kind of uh, what should I say? What sort of engagement that can there be at the level of If people actually, I mean, let me give you an example. Um, uh, I, I know of no university in, in, on the, that does not have any number of, of external examiners coming to Britain or Canada or the United States. The United States, not so bad. The, the rest, those countries coming to Britain as external examiners. Okay, so what does that, what does that tell you in, in terms of the message that is actually handing out? But yet, when um, the minister of whatever it is, Home Secretary or whoever, or indeed people like um, Sunak or, or Starmer want to do something about immigration, they talk about a point system and they want to cream off all the skilled people in those same countries to come to work here so so there, there, there are all kinds of contradictions within all of that but I think to begin with to begin with the major the major challenge we have is in getting people from the African diaspora particularly Thank you. Fascinating. And we'll be talking about those kinds of questions in upcoming seminars. So it will be really useful to be able to reflect sure. on that. Um, we've had a question which I thought would be a really nice question to ask both speakers to end with, because some students will have a 12 o'clock um, teaching session that they'll need to get to soon. So um, I think this is a good point to have our final question. Um, so Jose asked about your um, construction of your own identity um, at the beginning of the talk, Gus, when you talked about what you are and what you're not and, and how to define yourself. And he asked whether literature influenced your um, construction of, of your identity in that way. And I wondered whether both Gus and Yolanda could answer this question, thinking about the extent to which literature has influenced the construction of your identity or how you take decisions about how to present your identity? So I, I came to Britain to, to, to study theology, okay? I had been at a seminary in Trinidad, a completely weird thing to do at the age of 17. But anyway, I was at a seminary in Trinidad um, um, training to be a priest. All right. And then I came here to continue all of that. Um, I was trying to make sense particularly of the society that I was part of in the Caribbean, in, in Grenada. And getting a sense of who was writing about that uh, in in the Caribbean itself, um, and and what how I could learn about 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 that whole um, um, enslavement business. I have to say, I found I found the Caribbean writers very very fascinating. I mean, I I loved. Edgar Mittelholz's work, for example. Um, so the idea that literature can, okay, 
in, in school, we were given, we, we were encouraged to have this very highbrow attitude towards literature, right? Um, but 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 in in that set setting, what what was that? And helped me to understand uh, myself and and my positionality as a colonial subject, if you like in an island like Grenada. Yeah, so I'll try and keep it short. Um, yeah, for myself, I think it, it took maybe the late, well, I'm only 28, but the later years of my life to realize that literature actually played a part. So in school, couldn't stand it. Um, couldn't stand school. I liked the concept of English and that, but I just, I hated the concept of school, basically. Um, but I always thrived in England, in English, sorry. My teacher, she basically, she saw something in me that I, not that, I, I didn't see, I didn't care to um, water it and allow it to flourish. So, um, um, when it comes to actually reading books in school, I barely, read and like I was I wasn't really the English head even though I was very very good at it I was just never drawn to the literature that they gave us so I didn't see the point in continuing to follow what was in front of me because I didn't see myself in any of it nothing reflected the community in which like um, I grew up in and the classroom that we had so I, I was never really drawn to but I was very good at um, reading something, give you an explanation that the teachers would never be able to give you about what I've just been able to And my teacher was able to always, I guess, water that ability that I had so that can kind of flourish even more. But it's, it's more when we did the... the um, I forgot. Um, we were basically studying that, I forgot what it's called, but we were studying that and poems in that book, um, but it was outside of school, hearing, as Gus said, like hearing people that was able to really explain our stories, our cultures, our really read always take a hold on certain songs and the lyrics within the songs that um attracted me even more and I, the kind of work that I do currently and the poems I, I currently do because as I said earlier I don't see a lot of people really speaking for our community um so I would say it kind of Is my power that's in, in that manner, basically. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Gus John, and thank you, Yolanda Lear, for a really captivating, inspiring, uh, impassioned discussion and your talks and your poetry reading about the, the history, the present and the future of Black British writing, publishing, education, and the wider black African diaspora and society. And I think we've all had a lot of really exciting things to think about that we will continue to discuss in seminars. And I hope our public audience and formations has also um, started to have these conversations with their friends and family as a result of, of your um, presence here today. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here, Gus John and Yolanda Leah. Thanks, Dad. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.